Etang santang, etang panitang, yadidang sabha sankhara samatho, sabbu padi pati nisago, tanhakayo virago nirodo nibbanam. This is peaceful. This is excellent namely, the stilling of all fabrications, the relinquishment of all upadis, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinguishment. Namaste. This is an excerpt from the Mahamalumkya Sutta, spoken by the Buddha, and this is what's called an udana means a spontaneous exclamation of joy upon the realization of something profound. And this was spoken immediately after the Buddha's enlightenment, sitting under the bow tree, watching the dawn creep up in the sky and gradually fade out the planet Venus. Buddha got it. <laughs> So, at that point, he understood what is Nibbana. And so he expressed this verse. And we've discussed this in great elaborate detail in the Nibbana series seven years ago. So, I'm not going to explain it in detail now, but this is what Nibbana or Nirvana actually is, functionally speaking the stilling of all fabrications. Fabrications are acts of the intelligence to desire or create something in the world. And this is how we create the ego. This is how we create desires and become entangled in karma and suffering and all the rest. So if we're going to attain liberation, that has to stop. The next thing is the relinquishment of all upadis. Upadis are limiting adjuncts. They are what limits the self to a particular identity, individuality, body, mind, and so forth. And these are the things that separate us, the illusions that separate us from Brahman, that bring us into this world of duality and suffering. The destruction of craving means I don't desire anything in this world anymore. I don't want it. It doesn't do me any good. It's only another cause of suffering. Because if I desire something, basically I split myself into my present self and my future self. And there's a tension between them. In the present, I don't have the thing I desire. And in the future, I may have it, but then, see, that creates action. I have to go out and get it, or make it, or find it. And, of course, this is all suffering. So, detachment. Detachment, or sannyasa, is one of the prerequisites for attaining, or even studying, Vedanta, or Upanishads the nature of the self, because the self has no craving. The self is complete, full, purnam. Om purnamidam purnamada purnat purnam udajate purnasya purnamadaya purnareva vasishyate. This is the opening shloka of the Ishopanishad. So you see, all these things are related. They're all tied together. They're all part of the description of one truth. And what is that? Enlightenment. The enlightenment that Buddha realized is not different from the enlightenment of the Vedic sages, and it's not different from the enlightenment that we experience today. It's the same enlightenment. 
Buddha said that in one sutta. He said, the same emptiness that I am experiencing now, you will experience in the future. In other words, emptiness never changes. It is always the same. And what I'm realizing now and what you will realize when you follow my instructions, this is exactly the same thing and it will always be the same for everyone. So let's take a look at another example talking about the same thing. Atta yoga nushasanam yoga shchittavrti nirodaha Now, yoga, connection or relationship, is explained. Yoga is restraining the chitta, mind stuff, from vritti, modification, taking various forms. And these are the first two shlokas or sutras of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. So Patanjali is also talking about the same thing. This description of yoga is, if you analyze it technically, exactly the same as Buddha's description of Nibbana. No difference whatsoever. He says the cessation of chitta vritti, huh? modifications of the consciousness, modifications of the mind stuff. The mind stuff should return to its original state and remain there. That's yoga. Not, you know, tying yourself in a pretzel and standing on your head. <laughs> that hatha yoga is just to develop the ability to sit nicely and comfortably for long periods of time so that you can meditate, so that you can do all these other things. Stilling of the sankharas, cessation of the desires and cravings, renunciation of the upadis, and so on and so forth. That leads to the same state. The original mind, the empty mind, and this is the end state of Raja Yoga, of meditation. So now we've been talking about Brahman, which is in the language of the Upanishads. So let's take a couple of quotes from the Upanishads and see how they compare. Because when there is duality, as it were, then one smells something, one sees something, one hears something, one speaks something, one thinks something, one knows something. But when, to the knower of Brahman, everything has become the self, then what should one smell and through what? What should one see and through what? What should one hear and through what? What should one speak and through what? What should one think and through what? What should one know and through what? Through what should one know that owing to which all this is known? Through what, O oh Maitreyi, should one know the knower? This is saying the same exact thing. When there is apparent duality, there is the consciousness, the senses, the sense objects, the mind, words, and so on. All this is duality. And all this is required for us to have sensory experiences. But when one realizes that everything is the self, then there's no distinction anymore between the self and the mind, the mind and the senses, the senses and the sense objects. So, what is there to see and through what? Ultimately, what is there to know? And through what is, go is one going to know the knower, Brahman? And we've said this a bunch of times, that Brahman is imperceptible because it can't see itself. Just like a mirror can't reflect itself where the eyes can't see itself. Brahman is imperceptible because we are the self. 
Some people go looking for Brahman, you know. <laughs> the closest you can come is in deep meditation when you annul all the upadis and you can see the reflection of the light of the self in the intelligence. That's about as close as we can come to seeing the self. It's like looking at yourself in a mirror. So depending on how clean you have polished your intelligence, that's the quality of the image that you'll see. But, you know, basically the idea is just through knowledge to know, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. That's enough. If you work out for yourself the consequences of that knowledge, you become enlightened. There's no doubt about it. This is the message of the Upanishads. Here's another great quote. They consider the fourth, Turiya, to be that which is not conscious of the internal world, nor conscious of the external world, nor conscious of both the worlds, nor a mass of consciousness, nor simple consciousness, nor unconsciousness, which is unseen, beyond empirical dealings, beyond the grasp of the organs of knowledge and action, uninferable, unthinkable, indescribable, whose valid proof consists in the single belief in the self in which all phenomena cease and which is unchanging, auspicious, and non-dual. That is the self, and that is to be known." Tatvamasi, thou art that. So, it's not consciousness of this, it's not consciousness of this, it's not consciousness at all. There is no consciousness in the self, in Turiya. There is only pure, objectless awareness. In other words, the possibility of perception is there. But since there's nothing different from the self, how can it perceive anything? Because the self is not divided, it's one. This is the state of Turiya, and this is within all of us. It is operating all the time. It is the substrate of consciousness, and it is the content of self-realization. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.